Welcome to the Physical Ability Test. The Applicant Physical Ability Test was developed to allow West Metro Fire Protection District to obtain a pool of trainable employees that are physically able to perform essential job tasks at fire and medical scenes. The Physical Ability Test is comprised of two timed sections. Section 1 includes six separate fire ground tasks. Section 2 includes a single aerobic capacity evaluation called the Wildland Task. The Applicant Physical Ability Test is a score-based test just like the written exam. When you start out on the test initially, we throw a 50-pound hose pack over your shoulder. And when the individual takes that first step is when the stopwatch starts. And you carry that hose pack up the staircase. So when you're coming up the staircase, you have to hit every step with one foot. And uh, really what you're primarily working there is, you know, your quads and cardiovascular, you're going to feel a lot of uh, changes in, in your lung capacity. Your air is going to start to diminish as you get towards the top. I've been here since 2001, and I remember the day I walked on the drill ground to test to get hired. I was very nervous. I noticed right away that I was one of the only females that were there for that testing time slot. Uh, and I was just wondering if what I had done up to this point had prepared me to be successful. Uh, obviously, it's a time to bend. You want to hurry as much as you can, but the placement and the way that the way that you put it over your shoulder and secured it before you actually went saved time because if you just grabbed it and went, you're going to have to stop, you're going to have to readjust. And by taking that little extra time to put it in the right place to balance yourself out, it gives you a chance to actually do better time because you're, you're not having to stop and readjust everything. As they descend down the staircase to the third floor, the next station is they'll be pulling up a 50-pound sandbag hand over hand. When you're pulling up the, the sandbag, you're primarily using your biceps, your forearms, and a little bit of your lats. And then, you know, as you sink down, you can incorporate some of your hips and glutes, but primarily it's an upper body function. It, that's what the, the test is designed to test whether or not the individual has the upper body strength, you know, to, to be a firefighter. So I'm coming down the stairs, I'm feeling a little bit winded from the stair climb. And um, as I'm approaching station two, I grab the rope and place one foot out in front of the other where my front foot um, points towards the door frame. My back foot is uh, behind me as a nice anchor so that I can get uh, good strength from my pull using my arms and my grip strength to raise the sandbag up to the third floor. And as soon as you get the sandbag up the required height, you let go, step back, and the sandbag drops. Then you'll go across the tower, come down the staircase, hitting every step, come back underneath the tower to the next station, which is where now you're going to raise a 35-pound sandbag directly up, hand over hand in that motion. Pulling the halyard was tough because um, a lot of people want to use just upper body, you know, maybe just their forearms. But, um, it's really tough to do, but it's kind of a full body thing. You may think you're just using your arms, but um, to incorporate your lower back and your legs and get into it to be able to get it up was, um, you know, totally different than what I would think. And as soon as you get to the top, you have to come back down under control, hand under hand, so you cannot let the bag go. You come down with the sandbag, hand under hand under control, and once the sandbag hits the ground, then you'll transition to the west, to the hydrant where you're going to do the hose drag. So when you get to the hose, it's important that you pick the hose up, put it over your shoulder where the nozzle is almost touching the ground. What that allows for is less drag, less friction behind you because you're going to have less hose on the ground dragging. You know, you have uh, a charged hose line and it's deceptive. So when you initially start out and you come out of the blocks that first 10 to 15 feet, you don't have a lot of drag and friction yet. So a lot of people come shooting out of the gates. By the time you're about 20, 25 feet in, that drag really hits and it feels like there's an elephant on your back and you're really recruiting from the quads and the glutes and you're driving and it's a gut check to get through that 75 feet because you're losing your wind, your legs are starting to feel like rubber and uh, it's, it's the first wake up call during the test.
at the end of station four, you're going to lay down the uh, nozzle, not throw it down, and you're going to transition to the dummy drag. And the dummy, you have choices. When you get up to the dummy, you have a choice to pick the dummy up, or you have a choice to drag the dummy. And you, really, it's, it's any way to get the dummy from point A to point B, which is 75 feet apart. And there's a lot of strategy in this, because if you get behind the dummy and choose to pick the dummy up, it takes quite a bit of upper body strength to get the dummy off the ground, and then quite a bit of upper body strength to control the dummy through the 75 feet transition. If you decide to get inside the webbing or drag the dummy, it's a whole different ball game. Now you're gonna really put more of the load on the quadriceps, on the glutes, and you're gonna require a lot more oxygen utilization when you go through that section of the test. So, you know, it, it is really the, the most difficult portion of the test for most applicants and it's where we see our highest fail rate. The dummy drag is probably one of the most difficult uh, events on the course. Um, for me, the easiest way to do it is to actually get behind the dummy, pick it up, um, and then just walk backwards. It seems to be less resistance as you do it. So I set the hose down and I am getting ready to transition into um, picking up the dummy and my strategy is to get inside the webbing and to start pulling the dummy just with full force. I can feel my adrenaline kicking in and I just know that I have to keep driving my legs toward um, the end of this obstacle because I know that if I slow down the resistance of the dummy on the ground I won't be able to get it started again. After you successfully drag the dummy 75 feet you'll transition to the last station in the first section and that's the fan carry. So you'll come to a platform that's about four feet high and you'll transition the fan off the platform onto your shoulder, which is preferable, or you can carry the fan any way you'd like as long as it's above waist height. You'll carry that fan 75 feet, you'll go forward, you'll go around a box and then come back and set it down. In this section, you know, what you'll really find is that for some people, their legs at this point in time are shot. So they really do have that rubber effect where their legs are shaking beneath them, you know, their upper body's tired, and it's, you know, it's everything you can do just to pull it together and try and jog during that section to really shave off some, some time and increase your overall score. The fan, uh, it's the very end, so you're a little fatigued at that point, um, but it's at a sho basically shoulder height box, um, so it's easy to just throw it on your shoulder. Um, and then just go out, go around the corner, and then uh, once you get to that box, just kind of toss it up there as fast as possible. Um, but by then, you're pretty well spent as far as energy goes. After the dummy drag, my legs are feeling really fatigued, and it's all I can do to uh, walk over to the fan, try to run if I can. My feet feel pretty heavy. I'm shuffling uh, at best to get to that fan. I prefer to hold the fan on my shoulder when I accomplish this task simply because uh, it helps me to keep the fan up nice and high so that I don't have to use as much of my upper body strength to replace the fan back on the stand at the end. As I round the box and I'm making my way towards the end of section one, I'm feeling really fatigued and it's all I can do to hold on to that fan and make sure that I don't drop it as I bring it into the very end and place it on the on the box. Once section one is complete and the fan is down, then the applicant will immediately get their SCBA pack stripped off, their bunker cope stripped off, their gloves taken off, and at the same time, simultaneously, they'll be asked to walk forward at a slow pace by the test administrators. They'll walk them to the wildland section. So at that point, they'll walk about 200 feet while their gear is being stripped off. And then when they get to the line, they'll immediately have a 40 pound wildland vest put over their shoulders and strapped up nice and tight. And then they'll start the wildland portion. You know, the, where an applicant should be in the transition from section one to section two is really just controlling breathing taking deep breaths, five second breaths in, five second breaths out, and realizing they've got a minute and a half to two minutes left of the test. And it's where they make up all their time. It's where they can, you know, go from a 70 overall score to an 85 or an 85 to 100. So it's really just leaving it all on the course this last minute and a half to two minutes and really trying to transition almost into a full sprint the entire quarter of a mile.
Putting the vest on for the quarter mile, I thought it was very essential to make sure that it was on nice and tight. I knew that it was just a mind over matter, that I knew that I could finish the last 45 seconds, um, was just getting one foot in front of the other and striding as fast as I could. Nowadays, to stay in top shape, both for the test and just for the job, the everyday job, um, I do a lot of cardiovascular training, and a lot of it's high intensity anaerobic type training. I like to run up mountains um, or Red Rocks Amphitheater, for example. Um, and as far as weightlifting goes, I learned that I need to lift heavy. I need to lift heavier than um, most people you'll see in the gym lift. I do heavy Olympic lifting and that keeps me strong and building that strength and, that I need to get the job done. My advice to an applicant when coming in and, and preparing for the physical ability test is that now you've made a lifestyle choice when, you, when you're coming into the fire service and that really this training should be a part of your everyday life. So the combination of anaerobic and aerobic training is something that is gonna be a part of you for the next 30 or 40 years. So you're not necessarily training for a test, you're training for your career.